Today, I am joined by Cardano founder and also CEO of Input Output, Charles Hoskinson. Charles, welcome back to CCV. Appreciate you coming on. How, how is life? Life is good. A little, little busy. You know, I had a lot of calves, uh, deal with all the bison up at the ranch. We got a lot of great progress in all, most of the companies in the portfolio. My medical clinic up in Gillette, we had 6,200 patients the last time we counted. It's growing by leaps and bounds. A year ago, we didn't have any patients. Now we have 6,200. Um, you know, we're making great progress with Midnight, great progress with XE, great progress with Reflect. A lot to talk about there. Uh, incredible progress with Lace. There's a lot more to do there and uh, wonderful stuff happening with Cardano as well. So across the spectrum, it's, it's looking good. Personally, this quarter, I'm spending a lot of time learning how to learn. So I took Nick Milo's class, Linking Your Thinking, and uh, Zoltz's class on visual thinking, and some other people floating around the ecosystem on, on how to like use Obsidian properly and make link notes and you know think about uh, how to organize and structure a second brain, because it's just becoming so complicated and uh, dealing with all these different companies and demands and just so much to read every day, hundreds of pages of documents and tons of meetings. I'm working like 14, 15 hour days. Also just started the cold plunge too. You know, so I, every morning I come into the office, the first thing I do is uh, put on a bathing suit and jump into a cold water. It's uh, like two degrees Celsius. I think that's like 38, 37 degrees Fahrenheit uh, and stand there for three minutes, try not to die. But I got a lot of blubber, so actually, I think I could probably be in there for a lot longer. Are you are you are you liking that? I've always wanted oh, no. to try doing that stuff. It, it is it is psychologically traumatizing. You know, it's yeah. it, you get. I used to be you get up five a.m. you work out. You're like, oh fuck, I got to work out. Now it's like you don't even care about the working out. It's just like I I got to get in that water. It's going to be so bad, <laughs> you know. And I don't even want to go to bed anymore because I'm like, if I get up, I have to get in that water. But uh, you just put your David Goggins in the ears and you say like, let's get hard, yeah. So yeah. so you're running a you're running a ton of companies, and the one thing every day that you dread is is hopping in some cold water. Well, you know, don't knock it till you try it, man. Yeah. It's it's companies the worst you get yelled at or something or you lose some money. That water is just there's something like evolutionary in your brain saying, Don't do that. And every yeah. single time that moment before you dip in, there's this voice like, What the hell are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I imagine it's a it's a crazy mental builder. What it is actually now that you're talking about this, I want to jump into so many different things, which we're about to, but I, I was on a space the other day. You were talk because you're talking about all these things that you're doing. But the other day you were talking about you, what was it? You were taking some concrete class. Like, do you just do these random things? Is that something that's like no, a priority I, I for you too? I own a construction too? company. I own a construction ah, company. So that's why you're trying to learn about concrete. I got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we have a company. We build uh, a lot of the stuff for my ranch and also my healthcare clinic. And eventually we'll get into real estate. But, uh, you know, we, we have about 30 people in the construction company, got a lot of the trades represented. We just built a whole design team too. So we have MEP, structural, civil, and uh, architecture. And I was always curious about the concrete side of the business because I'm a big fan of geopolymer concrete, which is kind of like the next generation of concrete. And so I knew next to nothing of concrete. So I said, okay, I'm going to go to World of Concrete. It's out in Vegas every year. 35,000 people come to it. It's a thousand exhibitors. It's a huge conference. And I took 12 hours worth of courses on concrete. So I learned everything about aggregate selection and different types of cement and how ACI rates the stuff and how pozzolans work and admixtures work for the concrete. Uh, like, for example, you can put, uh, you know, like silica inside your concrete to make it harder, but then you usually have to use a super plasticizer because the workability goes to hell. The slump is basically too low in it. So I, I learned a lot in a very short period of time. We even got to pour some concrete and play with it and that type of stuff. <laughs> and so, but what's nice about it is it kind of keeps you thinking about how everything is linked and connected. You know, concrete is the second most common substance used by humanity. The first oh. is water. And, and when you really start thinking about that, you say, wow, it is actually kind of everywhere. Like everywhere you look, there's some concrete somewhere. So it's such a big part of our economy. And when you're, you're a blockchain guy, we're not just here for NFTs and financial products and these types of things. You want to apply blockchain to everything. And so if this is the second most common substance we use, we're going to have to start tracking it. Blockchains are probably going to get integrated into the whole concrete business. And, uh, and so from that perspective, it's good to learn about these things because it helps you find the interdisciplinary linkages and then at some point partner and work with people that have to evolve because of some ESG mandate or some sustainability issue or just cost. Price of cement has skyrocketed the last 10 years in particular. In the last three years, it's changed more than it's changed the last 30 years. Uh, you know, we've gone from standard specs to 
these new like Pazalon mixes with fly ash and all these other things. It's just really remarkable to see how a traditional thing that never changes changes super quickly. Yeah. Um, you know, Vaclav Schmil is this brilliant thinker who's in Canada and he wrote this lovely book, like how the world works uh, or something like that. And he talks about how there's like four substances we never think about, uh, but literally they, they guide the entire destiny of the entire world. You know, ammonia is one cement is another steel is a, uh, is another substance and plastics polymers and everything is some composition of these things. And the only reason we can survive and live and thrive is because they're readily available. And, uh, and we don't tend to think of the world in, in these terms or dimensions. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that's actually one of the things you were mentioning on that space when you were talking about this was things become way more interesting when you bring into play even more context and you see how there's overlap between different worlds. So now as you're talking again about it, I, I completely get what you're saying. Um, cool. So, all right. I have a I have a ton that I I want to go over, but I want to make I want to try and keep it clean and simple. But you know I want to I want to chat about stable coins, midnight scaling, governance, which is I think a huge topic uh, for Cardano. But I want to start with this last time last time that we spoke, we, you were on the channel. It was just over two years ago. I think you know the ecosystem was really just starting to wake up in terms, right. in terms of DeFi. There was like $1 to $2 million total value locked or something like that. And fast forward through a ridiculously brutal bear market, and this is what's so impressive to me, TVL managed to just slowly just rise, right? I think we touched like over half a billion dollars through right. a bear market, right? Um, my question is, you know, coming from the time just a couple years ago, Everybody just saying it's a ghost chain to hitting a half a billion dollars in total value locked in a bear market. How's that? How's that feel? How's that make you feel? Well, I'm proud of the community. I mean, look what they did, you know, whether you're fluid or OXO or Indigo or, you know, Iagon or, you know, it doesn't matter the project, Claymates, you know, uh, Ape Society, everybody carried their load and uh, people issued 8 million assets. We have tons of transactions every day. The blocks are mostly full. It's, it's pretty interesting. I've never seen a ghost chain where like every block is full. It's pretty ghost full or something like that. <laughs> um, but, you know, the problem is that we're being, the goalposts keep getting moved. Every day they keep getting moved. We keep growing. We keep delivering as an ecosystem. Yet somehow, some way, because the price of ADA isn't $10, the ecosystem has failed. Or we're not Ethereum in terms of a scale and adoption, that the ecosystem somehow failed. It's like every time we turn something on as an ecosystem, we've had overwhelming participation and constant growth and innovation. You know, I was at a conference with the Ethereum people, uh, QSIG, and I saw their head researcher come up and he's like, hey, you know, when we get these one-shot signatures, which need quantum computers to run, then we can have liquid staking and, and it will be at 50% Byzantine resistance. I'm just sitting there smiling. I'm like... You know, there may be another ecosystem that already <laughs> has this and doesn't need to use a quantum computer. It's in some ways we're so far ahead of, of so many people. But the problem is, it's just it started out of Japan. It grew organically. It's a very bottom up um, type of ecosystem, very bizarre in Cedar Cathedral. And because it didn't benefit the right people, it developed a reputation of the best case uh, as a science coin that never really does anything. Worst case, it's some sort of elaborate scam. And uh, that just stuck and people dug themselves in. Um, there also are definitely a very vocal minority of people who p really, really hate me. And they think every single dimension of me as a human being is evil and sociopathic and just made up and a lie. And so if you have that opinion, you can't admit that the founder of that project has built something worthwhile unless somebody else did it and then maybe that's what they'll do they'll be like oh well Fred Gard and the foundation did it or something like that it's like, if that's what it takes to get them on board okay um but you know there's a little bit of all of that the the the, the wrong vcs it's like as i said where you don't have the ponzinomics and the vcs didn't come in the 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 hatred of me and and the fact that it just follows a very radical anti-pattern of innovation and entrepreneurship generally speaking you don't do first principles peer-reviewed research if you want to be a startup and move fast and break things. And we did that 
And in many cases, we don't have the problems other people have, like the non-liquid staking or the constant network resets that certain ecosystems have or these things. And we have a beautiful roadmap. We know how to scale. We know how to get fast finality. You know, we know how to get partner chains in. We know how to get rollups in. We know how to get all these things in. And there's an inevitability about it. You go get in a coma and you come back three years later, it's there. It's not not going to happen. It's there. There's almost $750 million worth of ADA that's sitting in the Cardano treasury at the moment. And when 1694 turns on, if the community goes for that, they have control and governance over that money. That's crazy. So it's a giant bank account to basically spend on the growth and, uh, and uh, development and delivery of Cardano. It'll get done. And that's at current market prices. It goes back to the all-time high. You times that number by six. Okay, that's billions of dollars of capital available for the ecosystem to invest in itself and grow. And that's it today. You know, and you combine with the fact that our TVL keeps going up, the transaction volume keeps going up. And, you know, you see things like AXO, for example, where they can't deploy that model on Ethereum. You actually need an extended UTXO model, and they have massive advantages over an Ethereum DEX as, as a direct result of what they have. We're really starting to showcase to the world the design principles actually matter, and first principles actually matter. So it's frustrating at times, but on the other hand, it doesn't really matter because does it actually affect our ability to grow? Not really. We keep building bridges. We're starting to get along with people. We get along great with Algorand, with Polkadot now, thanks to the partner chains framework. We have great relationships with uh, the IOTA community. Um, actually, I was just in a space the other day with the VeChain people, and they get along very well with us. They, uh, and also, we're starting to build bridges with all people that had Dara Hashgraph people. You know, so we, we get along with a lot of people. There are certain communities that are a little rougher than others, like, and it's usually because they hate me. But, you know, Intersect is changing all of that because the face of Cardano is now the community. And so, you know, come back in a year, Intersect is doing everything. In which case they'll say, oh, they finally fired Charles. Now we can love Cardano. And that's fine. That's great. It actually solves the problem, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because that was, and I just got a comment, or not a comment, I saw a clip yesterday on a really big YouTube channel too. Um, they were just talking about Cardano DeFi being non-existent. And I was, I was mentioning to you before we started recording, like on the same time when something like AXO is launching, which is so, it's so innovative in the crypto space, I just, it would be so cool if people across the space were like, dude, that's a really cool product. Look at that on Cardano, but it's not right. like that. What's the, what's the tipping point where, where those people that are constantly just spreading those false narratives, what's the tipping point where that might end or was it just not going to end even when we're it'll end because of the partner chains framework you know that's cardano being open for business blockchain to blockchain sales so yeah. midnight is going to have more i in my view ethereum bitcoin customers than it will cardano just by scale and they'll view cardano as a service layer that sells them interesting and intriguing things whether it be decentralized hosting or whatever and what they'll do is they'll conceptualize it as a layer two of ethereum not realizing that the security and, and the model actually comes from Cardano and they don't really care too much, you know, because it's you know, it just all one thing. And frankly, the meta blockchain play is where you want to be. Look at layer zero. You know, they raise like, what, $180 million at a $3 billion valuation and their whole Omni app concept is where Chainlink's going too. So, you know, it, 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 sure, there's ego and rivalries and these things, but the reality is that the space is already moving on and there's a great maturing that's occurring. And what people are starting to realize is we're being eaten from the inside out by the financial institutions. Uh, the ETFs are here to come. They're getting massive amounts of power by aggregating assets and they have soft power now over Bitcoin. And then look at, but like 80%, I think of all the value of transactions, of velocity transactions come from asset-backed stable coins, which are not cryptocurrencies. So when you really think about it, you're starting to see an undue huge amount of power from asset-backed stable coins, sexes and ETFs that means the legacy financial world is eating crypto. Crypto is not eating them. So if you really care about the values, you, what you're going to do is start migrating to chains that are preserved and protected you know, from those, those bad things. And Cardano is one of the few ecosystems that's a holdout, and it still actually has some degree of independence from those, uh, those people. And the latest governance moves that have been pushed, I think, will permanently put Car Cardano beyond touch. You know, it's, it's focusing on decentralization, resilience, and decentralized control, and no one faction or party can go and co-op the system. Yeah, and, and I, I want to touch on that now that we're kind of talking about governance a little bit, because I think it's, and we're entering that, that era, right? The Voltaire era. First off, because you mentioned Intersect, right? So for, for anybody out there 
that's not aware of what Intersect is. What what is Intersect? What does it have to do with governance and you know the constitutional framework of Cardano? So there are three pillars to good governance, and no matter who you are, you need these three pillars if if you believe you're actually going to govern. First, you have consent, democratic consent. So if you're going to do something, the people that it impacts in some way or form or fashion, either directly or indirectly through a representative, they have to put a thumbs up or thumbs down. Uh, and if you don't have that, you don't have real governance. You have a dictatorship. Um, second, you need some form of institution. And institutions, their job is to take really complicated things and turn them into simple things that can get a thumbs up or thumbs down. For example, a budget process. It's a really complicated thing because you're thinking about the whole totality of the ecosystem and trying to cut wedges in a pie and figure out how much to allocate in each one on an annual basis uh, and get that done. So how much should we spend on education? How much should we spend on developer acquisition? How much should we spend on marketing as an ecosystem? How much should we spend on basic science? How much should we spend on development of the core protocol? How much should we spend on development of things on top of the core protocol? How much should we spend on client diversity? For example, do we have a Rust node in addition to a Haskell node? These types of things. You add all that together, you get a pie. And that's a complicated conversation with many different people. You're not going to get that done in a chaotic way. You have an institution lead that, and that institution then gets a recommendation, and then you vote on it. And then finally, you need constitutions. And the point of a constitution is to protect minorities and protect fundamental rights. Like, I rather like the fact that ADA is a deflationary currency. I would not be in favor of people printing a billion ADA out of thin air to go and you know pay for their favorite pet project. Well, the conservation of ADA might be a constitutional property that we sh as a community should vote on. And there are other things too, like transaction discrimination. I rather like the fact that if you issue a transaction and I issue a transaction, the protocol treats them exactly the same way. You know, transaction neutrality. We really should not allow people to discriminate one way or the other. Well, we're starting to see discrimination now in other systems that shall remain nameless. And uh, maybe just maybe we should put that in as a uh, constitutional right. So you stitch those three things together, you have the baseline of a government, whether it's good, whether it's effective, whether it's fair and equitable, all of these things, these are qualitative, quantitative properties of it. And you can measure those things for the most part, and you can decide whether it's fair or not. If you have a good recursive government, though, it can change itself. One of the reasons why America is falling apart is that it has two problems that have occurred at the same time. One problem is that the Constitution and the current governing structure is not fit for purpose to actually run America. There's a fourth branch of government that took 100 years to really fully realize itself, the bureaucratic arm, and it's completely unaccountable to the American people. And the Constitution didn't conceive of it, so there's nothing in the Constitution that constrained that fourth branch of government. Well, normally, if you had a well-functioning government, the government would realize that, and what would they do? Change the Constitution and amend it to protect itself against this fourth branch. But both parties have basically reached a deadlock, so you can't change anything. So you have an unchanging government. So if Cardano's governance is successful, you'll have those three institutions, but if they don't really do a good job, you should be able to change it via a hard fork to a new governing structure to accommodate the times. And if it can't change, it's a failed governing layer. You see, so we're experimenting with all this. And there's what's great is so many people are engaged. Thousands and thousands of people are like working full time or investing their, their part time or getting involved in many different formats to help build that minimum viable governance and also that recursive governance. And there's already people learning how to be D-reps. They're, you know, the, the, basically the congressmen and women of the uh, system and people participating in the civics committee. And to your uh, question about Intersect, that's kind of the nexus point where those conversations occur. It's a members-based organization and it's what you see is what you get. The members join it, they build the committees, and it's taking over the product function of Cardano. All the GitHub repos have moved from input output, and now they're actually at Intersect. So IO developers amongst 15 other companies that work on the core protocol are contributing code now to Intersect, not the input output repos. And also the product backlog and product function of Cardano is rolling over there. So the question is, what should uh, protocol parameter be? Or what should Plutus V4 look like? Or, you know, should we sport Aiken more? And, uh, you know, should we accelerate Leos so we get uh, sharding on the base layer? That's all questions now that are being asked and answered at Intersect. And whatever the answers are, that goes in the product backlog. And then development companies like IO, they say, all right, well, that's, that's what we're doing. Let's figure out a way to get it done. And we go write the code and submit it to those repos. 
Um, and then the other thing they do is uh, Intersect is taking over a lot of the fundamental conversations about the Cardano Constitution. And what they're going to do is kind of write a proto thing and then have uh, basically workshops around the world, probably more than 50, many different countries. And uh, then also they're starting the budget process as well. Because if 1694 comes in, that budget's open. And it's instead of just being a, a like a sovereign wealth fund that accrues and accrues, you actually spend now. So there needs to be a budget process. So if you want to participate in this, join Intersect. The only requirement is to have ADA. One ADA is enough. So just join Intersect, participate in it, and you'll have a voice on the budget, the product backlog, all these types of things. And then what ends up happening is whatever the recommendations are, they get sent to the government of Cardano, the D-reps and the rest of the gang, and they'll vote on it, yes or no. So that's your on-chain governance component, and the institutions are your off-chain. Now, the other institutions don't leave. The Cardano Foundation is still around. IO is still around. Emergo is still around. We just have different places and roles you know, than we used to, and we can still deal with things. Like We're still one of the best firms in the world to do cryptocurrency research. We have that amazing group, 168 collaborators, 201 papers. We're going to keep writing papers. We still have a gigantic cabal of engineers, and they're very good engineers, and they're very qualified to do this type of work. And the same for the foundation. They're starting to wake up, and they're doing a lot of really interesting things. Uh, from the wallet back end, the address due team moved over there, and they have a whole supply chain thing they're doing in Georgia, and they're doing education now with the state pool education and all this other stuff. So they're still around. You know, and uh, and now just allows them to focus more on these types of things, and they don't have to worry about being everything to everyone. Yeah. So obviously, the whole governance thing is going to be this continuous in this continuous state of progression. But I think it's I think a lot of people might not even realize it's kind of already it's already in play. It's all the shift is already happening to for Cardano yeah. to become even more decentralized. Like it's happening right the now. Most, my goal is this year, make it the most decentralized cryptocurrency in the market and as measured by the Edinburgh Decentralization Index. So that's another thing that we built in parallel as an ecosystem. It wasn't just good enough to say it. You know, words are cheap. Somebody objective and neutral has to measure something. So we worked with the University of Edinburgh. They hired professors and graduate students and professional engineers. And they have eight different metrics that they put together to measure the level of decentralization of a cryptocurrency. And so what they're doing now is starting to measure Ethereum and Bitcoin and eventually Cardano. They're going to work their way down the list and then create a number. And, and then you can look at the number and say, okay, you're this much decentralized. Because it always yeah. bothered me when the SEC would say, well, Bitcoin is sufficiently decentralized and Ethereum is sufficient. What the fuck does that mean? It's nuts. And we all have an opinion. Well, obviously it is. Well, but what does it mean from a network capacity, a tokenomics viewpoint, a governance viewpoint, a software development project management viewpoint, from a consensus perspective, all these different things? We should be able to look at them in an objective, measurable way and compare and contrast apples to apples, each cryptocurrency with each other. So what I'd love to see is after all these bells and whistles come in with SIP 1694 and Intersect and the rest of the gang, that you turn the crank, you measure it, and whatever Bitcoin is, uh, that uh, Cardano is higher. And we'll see if we can get there as an ecosystem. But at least it's a North Star, because if we're not there, then when you talk about the budget of Cardano, that can become a budget priority. And saying, how do we bridge that gap for 20% less decentralized than Bitcoin? How do we, in two years' time, be more decentralized as measured by EDI? You see, and then that becomes something you can hold your stakeholders accountable to. And you said, you said you would find a way to get us there. You didn't get us there. You're fired. Get out. And somebody else is going to come in. That's mm. good governance is when you have the ability to objectively measure reality, have a KPI to target. You can then measure it. And then everybody agrees that that measurement's accurate. And then you can go and come up with a strategy on how to chase it. And then if people get there, huzzah, you know, you get a gold star. If they don't get there, you fire them and you put new people in and those new people get it done. That's a, kind of a good point. That, that, the, so the question is, do you think that there would be any conflict between community-driven governance, which what we're talking about, and and the need for strategic direction? No, because what the community can do is they can set the agenda. They can say things like, look, we really want to have X, Y, and Z. So X can be decentralization, Y can be performance and throughput, Z can be adoption. And they can set those big trends and then we can agree on the measurements. Then what you do is you have an RFI and RFP process. People come together and they say, this is the strategy we think is going to work. And then at some point, the community votes on which one they want. And then they go open up the treasury and they fund that direction. 
And then what happens is, unlike conventional politics, you actually have a report card. That this problem with America is like you got Joe Biden and you got Donald Trump. If you talk to Trump, he's the best guy since Jesus. You talk to Biden, he's like, I've never done anything wrong my whole life. You know, I grew up in a log cabin that I built myself as a baby. You know, it's like these guys are perfect. But then the problem is like, where's the objective reality? What metrics upon which can you assess whether they got a C or they got an A or they got a B? So what the community needs to do is set the strategy. And they set that based upon some things that should be reasonable. And then you have objective metrics to measure reality. And then you go and get people to come up and say, we're going to go do that. And then you measure it and hold them accountable accordingly. And if they do a great job, you pay them well. And if they don't do a great job, you fire them and replace them with other people. You have a governance failure where you know they're doing a bad job, but you can't fire them. Like DHS is a great example where you have just this deplorable situation at the southern border of the United States, but the guy in charge of that can't be fired because it's just how politics work. You know, and by the way, it's not even Democrats bad. I mean, like, look at George Santos. It took us so long to get rid of that guy, but he was because he's team red and red's got to back him, you know, and so you can't fire anybody anymore. It's so hard to do that. So you can't hold people accountable whether they're doing a good job or not. So we, we thought as a community really hard at how do you build a governing on chain and off chain system where you can separate concerns and you can in one place really set an agenda and strategy another place, solicit feedback from the broader community and see who wants to pursue it. And then how do you hold those people accountable once they're pursuing it and with enough regularity that they can actually get it done. And then we can all see if we've won or not. We do this in sports. You know, if I'm a Denver Broncos fan, I want to see the Broncos, you know, win the Super Bowl. Either they win it or they don't. And if they don't, well, did they at least have a good season? Was it 10 and six or was it two and 14? If it's 10 and 6 and they're on the uptrend, you keep the coach. If it's 2 and 14, you fire them, you get a change of direction. We just organically think the world should work this way, but somehow in government, we keep the same people in power despite the fact that they're just terrible. Uh, so we're kind of used to governance being bad, but leisure and companies being good. And I, I think that's uh, a mistake. We need to hold that same standard to the Cardano community. And I think there's that mindset. People are already really stepping up. The civics committee at Intersect is doing a phenomenal job, kind of thinking around good governance, everything from best practices and for DREPs to the constitution itself. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about how to start the budget process for Cardano. There's a lot of discussion about taking over the Cardano product function. And at the end of the day, it's either going to be great or, or, or not. It great would be defined as you get what you're getting right now or better. Not would be you have a slowdown of what you have, or we start seeing mistakes being made that regress uh, the things we've already earned, like the security and uptime of Cardano, for example. Yeah. Last question in terms of in terms of this topic. Topic. Do you think Cardano is positioned to be the dominant governance system? In crypto, I believe I believe so because there's a lot of great ecosystems out there. Everything is so adversarial, unnecessarily adversarial. It's like guys grow up. Tezos has done a great job in certain dimensions and not so great of a job in other dimensions. Polkadot with OpenGov has done a great job in certain dimensions, not such a great job in other dimensions. Some people are anarchy. Bitcoin is pure anarchy. Ethereum is basically a cult of personality around a small group of stakeholders, and they say beneficent people figure this out. And every one of these systems, they have pros and cons. It's damn near impossible to change Bitcoin, which means that if you're happy with the current design, you get the closest thing you can get to digital immortality. It's going to be that way forever. But if you need that design to change for your business, you have a better luck convincing the Pope to become Jewish. It's just not going to happen. Okay. So, so, so it, that's the thing. It's like, you just can't change that ecosystem. Ethereum can change, but it only changes in one direction according to the will of a very small group of uh, exclusive people because they're running like an open source project with a beneficent dictator for life, like the early days of Linux or the early days of a lot of programming languages like uh, Python or Ruby or these things. They say, what does Matz believe? Let's go do that. And there's nothing wrong with that approach. It actually works really, really well as long as you agree with that guy. You'll notice you have a lot of flavors of Linux. You'll notice you have a lot of different programming languages because people don't always agree. So you, you tend to get more fragmentation. People tend to leave if they're not included in that roadmap. And those who dare to do on-chain governance, the problem is that you want contradictory things. You want stability and efficiency and clarity and simplicity. You want reliability. 
but then you want inclusion. The problem is the minute you embrace inclusion, you slow everything down because you got that one guy you got to go talk to and convince, and it might take six months to convince them. And the minute you have inclusion, you have more people at the table, you have divergent roadmaps. In some cases, you actually embrace things that may hurt your security or your reliability of the system and if because they want to maximize throughput. This is the, the whole Solana thing. They can't really actually understand why their protocol collapses at times. They just accept it as a fact of life, but they get the benefit of high throughput. And they say, look, we can fix that later, but right now is our growth phase. So, you know, like any startup, we'll just move fast and break things and nobody really cares. And well, look at the price. Maybe they're right if the only thing you care about is the asset price on market. You see, but if you care about other things like decentralization, philosophy, resilience, uh, long-term viability of the ecosystem, preventing it from getting co-opted or having existential risk, maybe just maybe that's not the right approach. You see, and that's the values thing. But the more inclusion, the more different values you have, because you're going to invite people at the table where the only thing they care about is price goes up. And those people have a right to be there because they hold data just as much as the people who are hardcore philosophers with a white beard saying we will live in a philosopher's utopia and somehow you have figured it all out. That's why most people don't want to do on-chain governance. It's such a headache because you have to somehow get those people to talk to each other and actually agree uh, to do the right thing, whatever yeah. the right thing means, you know, and Cardano, if it wins there, it's indestructible a cause it'll never die. It's impossible to kill a decentralized movement once you have it running. I mean, it's like the Roman Empire trying to kill Christians. It just doesn't work. You know, no matter how many you kill, there's more of them and then they'll, they'll eat you alive at some point. 300 years, they went from an underground cult to the emperor becoming Christian. It's a very powerful thing when a philosophy's time has come. And then the second thing is you're smarter than everybody else. Why? Because you have a decentralized brain and you have everybody's intellect adding together. Corporations are super intelligences and decentralized movements that properly harness the knowledge, they're super intelligences that are resilient and self evolving. Uh, so, uh, those two characteristics mean in the long run, you'll always win because every one of the competitors' technology is open source that matters. And so, you can just always go and absorb all of that stuff. They build something good, we'll take it because it's open source. You know, the ideas are there, they'll come. And so the dif differentiator is not like a, some killer feature that's patent protected. The differentiator is the ecosystem. And if your ecosystem never loses and always gains ground, it doesn't matter if it takes you five years or 10 years or 15 years to grow from 1 million to 10 million. Once you have those 10 million, you have 10 million and you're 10 times more capable. And with that extended brain, you, that is what's going to get you to 100 million. Then you're wake up, you're at a billion. You never lose because you never lose people. They stay. And why wouldn't they? They're going to go to some other standard where they have less rights, less value. It's kind of a funny thing. It's like all these people fled from Cuba to the United States, but there weren't a lot of people fleeing from Florida back to Cuba. They kind of go from less free to more free, you know, uh, in terms of political systems. And analogously, we tend to gravitate towards systems where we have more human rights, more autonomy, more freedoms, more economic opportunity. So wouldn't you rather live in a crypto system where you have those properties and the on-chain government protects you and preserves that as opposed to migrating to a system where you have a dictator that basically just decides if, you know, if they wake up on the left side of the bed, you get this, they wake up on the right side, you get that, you know, that's, that's always been my view. And uh, I don't think it's historically controversial, um, but you know, it's controversial and only in that people have economic incentives to disagree. They have to talk their book. You know, it's not like, oh, well, Charles is right. Well, Charles is right. And I hold assets in the other system. It's like being a real estate holder in the, in the communist dictatorship. It's like, well, you know, I'm kind of in the Politburo. I kind of have a business here. I kind of doing this thing. I, I really can't disagree. I can't agree with you because, well, if I disagree, I'm going to end up, you know, reading Taoist poetry and wandering the streets of Bangkok, you know, uh, like certain people like Jack Ma. Okay. I, I want to pivot, but it's a little bit of a connection here in terms of the governance conversation we were just having in terms of stable coins. So, and I, I actually just recently learned this. I didn't realize your interest for stable coins kind of goes back to your days with BitShares, which is yep. from this company that you founded, Invictus Innovations. So it seems like it's always been something that's kind of important to you, huh? Oh my God. Well, because it, there are two things you need in order for your system not to get co-opted by the legacy financial system. 
you need liquidity. You need the ability to move in and out of positions and assets and these types of things. You'd be able to trade. So you need exchanges. And if you actually want to be a currency, you actually want to be economically dominant, replace the US dollar, you need a stability. So if you don't have liquidity and stability, you're done. So I started BitShares because it had built in it an algorithmic stablecoin and an algorithmic DEX. And this was before Ethereum. Now it didn't work, you know, and true to form, like my co-founder was Dan Larimer and he went on and created EOS and Steemit and all these other things. And the rest is history there. And I went on and created Ethereum with Vitalik. So you can judge who is the better one. But um, it's been an interest of mine forever because my concern is if we don't control those, they're going to get co-opted and taken over. And that's literally what's happening. If you look at the vast majority of value transfer in crypto rails, it's either Tether or Circle on a daily trading volume. And both of them are centralized entities subject to regulation and control. And if you look at where all the crypto is being held and all the crypto is being traded, the vast majority is on centralized exchanges. So 10 actors, if you sum up together, control maybe 80, 90% of the happening of a multi-trillion dollar ecosystem. If those were algorithmic and on-chain, zero actors would control that. Everybody would control it. The protocols have those capabilities. So you damn right, I believe, in algorithmic stablecoins. And we even started a company here called XE, led by Sean Ford, the former CEO of Algorand. Uh, and that company is pursuing and trying to figure out how to build the core infrastructure and technology to not only get those things done, but get them done in a way that is values compatible with cryptocurrencies. So they're decentralized, resilient, self-sovereign, they don't have centralized power or control or these types of things and trustless. Okay, so the, what's on the label is there. You don't have to trust if Tether is solvent or not. You don't have to trust that the U.S. government is going to shut down USDC or whatever have you or these types of things. So, yeah, it's a huge passion of mine. And I think so few people, especially layer one builders, really take a strong position on it because they love the money. They love the relationships with the, the sexes. They love the relationships with the stablecoin vendors. And they need these to make their millions to billions of dollars and get their token price high and build DeFi products and these types of things. But okay, I guess you can go and be a shareholder in BlackRock. You know, it's like, oh yeah, there's plenty of ways you can make plenty of money, but that's not philosophically compatible with where the industry goes. So you have to kind of balance it. And uh, this is why you need decentralized governance because then you can have your cake and eat it too. Some people can go and deal with them and talk with them because it does create value. But at the very least, you always have a decentralizing option that runs at the same time and it doesn't get co-opted or compromised or shut down. Okay, so kind of the, the best of both worlds because there's recently been a lot of chatter about USDC in particular and implementing it on Cardano I'll, via I'll give you a great example. Community. This one pisses me off more than anything else. So... You know, uh, in 2021, I think the foundation spearheaded a conversation with them and there was some economics that they were going back and forth on. It was never a technological question, ever. We said, look, we cut Rosetta to work with Cardano for Coinbase. You come to us, tell us what you need. If, if Circle needs us to do a bunch of stuff, we can figure out a way to make that work with a Cardano smart contract. It's not an inconceivable thing. There's a way to do this. So it's not that Cardano is incompatible with what Circle wants to do. There was never a technological problem there. For some reason, it was a business conversation. And it's like, okay, well, I, and it, it's really strange in that there's enough desire, I think, in Cardano to pay Circle, the company, what they want, or at least what they asked for back in 2021, but they've just been ducking the calls. Fred Gagard has tried, I think, five, six, seven times to get in contact with Jeremy. And through many different sources. And it's it's crazy because one of the board members of the Cardano Foundation, his name's Fernando, he does a ton of work with SBI and these other things. And they're working with Singapore on this whole stablecoin thing. Uh, and Circle's a member. And they're like all talking to each other. And yet for some reason, they just won't have that commercial conversation uh, and, and figure it out. Because you know, at the end of the day, it's like if Circle came in and said, give us $10 million, you don't think the treasury of Cardano, that would pass? If the people are asked, they, they'd say yes to it. It's not a it's not a money thing. It's it's I don't understand it. Maybe it's we are doing stuff in uh, Wyoming with a stablecoin project there, and Circle's deeply concerned that if the state of Wyoming issues a stablecoin, this could catastrophically implement uh, in, in inhibit their market share. By the way, one of the people there is 
used to work for Circle as their general counsel, and uh, they've been trying very aggressively to do Ethereum only, although that's gone multi-chain. So maybe that's the issue. Maybe that's the wedge there, and it's just retaliation for for you know Cardano trying to be one of the places that has the Wyoming stablecoin. Um, maybe you know I was at a party with Jeremy, and he didn't like uh, he didn't like the cut of my jib. I don't know. I I don't think I've ever met him in person. I don't think I, I met his son once at an event in D.C. But I can't for the life of me understand it. We're we're I O sitting on the sidelines saying, "You come to us with some stuff, we'll build it." And the foundations sitting there, they did all these financial models, and they said, "This is how much money Circle can make, being the dominant stablecoin in the Cardano ecosystem, and it's in the eight figures annually. So it's a huge sum of money for them. Um, you know, actually, I think it might even be nine figures, you know, annually, um, uh, or you know, like mid eight to nine. It's like a big chunk of cash that they could make with the DeFi ecosystem we have. And obviously, we would like to have an asset-backed stablecoin for our real fi portfolio. A lot of stuff we're doing in Africa." We need a stable asset on Cardano to lend for the microfinance transactions. So it's it's a very bizarre situation, and and I you know it's nothing on my side where I'm like oh I don't want to pay this thing or do that thing or that. Um, at first, it's not our role to pay. You know, it's either CF or the community through the treasury function. It's our role to build. And if we got an instruction, hey, Intersec wants to do an integration with Circle. Circle join Intersec. We'll sit down roll all the product requirements out, get it in the roadmap, we can do that. It's not a problem. It's not a technological thing. It's not like Cardano is deficient and it's incompatible or things like that. But I've just seen so much FUD. I saw stuff on Twitter floating around like, oh, the only reason they're doing it is Charles doesn't want to pay $10 million. Or they're, they, they're they not doing it because uh, the ecosystem's too small. They just announced like Mina integration or something like that. Or, or actually it was Cello, I think, was the cryptocurrency that they integrated with $300 million market cap. So you're fucking telling me there's there's that much volume on that? It's almost personal when you look at these types of. It's ridiculous to say well, that's that. That's my no, it, that's my kind of my point. It's it's I didn't and actually yeah. I didn't I didn't realize that that there was actually more going on and it's kind of like once again Cardano's being secluded, and it, again in this regard it really it really boggles my mind. So putting that aside for just a second, you know, if it were to happen, right? If it's community driven approach, you know, USDC ends up on Cardano. You think it would be a good thing for Cardano, right? I'm, I'm ambivalent. I mean, uh, in the absence of it, a lot of community projects are building stable coins. Uh, and obviously, we're pursuing the algorithmic path, which is harder, but, you know, maybe that gets adoption. We'd be the first ecosystem where algorithmic stable coins dominate as opposed to asset backed. Uh, and that's a good thing, I think. Um, but anyway, I'm ambivalent. Yeah, whether it's there or not, uh, it'll it'll come. A nature abhors a void, and people want stability. They'll find a way to cr- construct it one way or the other through synthetic products or through, you know, bridges where they actually take wrapped uh, assets and they bring them in. The Nomad Bridge brought in a lot of USDC, and that's what did in Wing Riders when the Nomad Bridge got hacked. You know, so it'll happen one way or the other. Um, uh, it, it's frustrating. But it was frustrating when Coinbase hadn't listed ADA, and it happened. Yeah. You know, yeah. it is, so inevitably these types of things happen. Um, and when they don't happen, you start scratching your head and wondering. There's got to be more to the story. Like FTX for longest time wouldn't list Cardano. Well, A, because they were all in in Solana, and B, maybe they that our values are incompatible with FTX's values. And I, I you know, Gemini won't list ADA for some reason. Can't Crazy. figure that one out. You That's know, the thing. Keep, Gemini, yeah, Masari, like, like, like yeah. everybody. Well, Masari, that one was crazy, man. Um, but it's just everybody. Everybody. It's not everybody. It's not. You're right. You're right. It feels like everybody, <laughs> but we, you know, we they grudgingly respect us after one or two, you know, shots. Again, because either they hate me or they they told all their friends at cocktail parties not to worry about Team Cardano, and now that we're still around, they have to explain it away somehow. You know, and they'll just go back to Lara's book or something. Uh, yeah. But, you know, does that materially affect us? No, our TVL is way up. Our transaction volume is way up. The blocks are mostly full. Eight million assets issued. The roadmap is saturated. It looks great. Decentralized governance is chipping away, churning away. We have a beautiful view on how to achieve scale. It's multimodal from roll-ups and recursion to off-chain Hydra to partner chains to sharding at the layer one via input endorsers. And we're pursuing all of them in parallel with parallel teams. There's a vibrant ecosystem there. And it's the most balanced and holistic ecosystem of any cryptocurrency, you know, at the moment. 
So I like those prospects. And there's a lot of real world applications. Some we're building, some other people are building uh, that are coming in. So, you know, as I said, the coma effect, come back every three years, wake up from your coma and look at where we were. Look at where Cardano was at in 2020 Crazy. versus 2023. And imagine yeah. where we're going to be in 2026. Yeah, it feels like staking was just coming on and then all of a sudden here we are. And it happened so fast too. Yeah. If, if USDC were like the floodgates open, because we're going to start talking about scaling a little bit, something like that happened, USDC is open. Do you, would you anticipate any type of scaling issues if that were to happen or are we ready for that? Is Cardano ready for that? Well, there's a marketplace for scale. And what ends up happening is you very naively use the system, you'll saturate it very quickly. And what ends up happening is people realize there's more efficient ways of doing things. Just switching from Plutus V1 to Plutus V2, usually you get a 10x reduction in transaction size. So is that a scale problem or is that I wrote my so software the wrong way problem? It almost reminds me back in the early days when we were going from single thread to multi-threaded, you know, single core to multi-core, you'd have all these people and they're like, I'm not going to rewrite my software. So you have this computer with four cores and it's only using one of the four cores. So three of the cores are dark. They're not doing anything at all. And one is super hot. And then the application's running slow and the user's like, oh, Intel sucks. This chip's not very fast. Well, if they rewrote their software, your application could be 400% faster. Even though, you know, all the computer science stuff aside, maybe you get like a two or three X in real life performance, but they didn't rewrite the software. And then suddenly other people did and they say, oh, I'm just going to buy this software over there. It's, it's a lot better. So I think that's part of your games is, and, and you're starting to see this with Sunday Swap V3 and what MinSwap is doing. And you're starting to see this with AXO and these other dApps are they're learning how to use the hardware. To use an analogy, remember the first generation games on the Xbox 360 to the very end, what the games look like, or even a better analogy. It was the same hardware that ran Super Mario, ran Mario uh, Brothers and Mario Brothers 3. Look mm -hmm. at the difference in those games. You know, one is just this super pixelated thing and they're jumping and terrible music. And then the, the third one, you have a whole fucking world. You have multiple maps. You actually have an item menu. You can fly in the sky. You can do the same hardware. Yeah. Why? Because they had enough time to be able to learn how to optimize and use that hardware appropriately. They didn't have to go and build a new Nintendo to do all that stuff. So there's a little bit of that. Now at the same time, there's now the communities taking over. There's an on-chain parameter committee. And you know if they want to increase the block size and mem units or other things, they will. And that will happen uh, organically. And then uh, people are learning how to use Hydra. And actually Hydra is going to hit a major milestone sometime this year with incremental commit and decommit. You don't have to shut the head to be able to deposit and withdraw for, uh, funds. So that's going to really help a lot of DeFi. Um, that said, there's a humongous body of research on how to actually shard Ouroboros. It's called Ouroboros Laos is the design with that. In 2022, we kind of sketched out an algorithm and said, this is kind of how it's going to get done. And now our guys are really drilling into the nuts and bolts of the computer science because we don't want a Solana situation where you deploy this and then you have these unpredictable stalls and the whole network has to reset. The good news is we figured out how to do it. And... You know, it's just going through the standard computer science peer review set of things. But if the community says, you know, we're really concerned about scale, you know what they do in the budget process? They pull that lever down and they say, okay, we're going to scale it up. We're going to hire more people. We're going to have competing teams. We're going to do this whole thing. We want it done faster. Okay. It's their prerogative. You know, from our part, we actually got a bunch of fixed cost contracts out to do chunks of work like Orboros Genesis. You know, it was always like, we'll get around to it as an ecosystem. So, you know, we did, we called up Twig, a French contractor. And we said, would you do this as a fixed cost contract? They said, sure. And they signed that deal 12 months ago. They're almost done with their delivery and it'll be delivered sometime in the April to May timeframe and then put on the shelf for integration and just have fine integration window for it. Well, that's pretty cool that you can just take this gargantuan chunk of work, hand it to them, and then they go and do it. So once Laos gets to a certain level of software readiness, it's called an SRL um, and a business readiness, you could take that entire chunk of work as a package and hand it to a firm. And it'll probably be some combination of P and SOL, uh, Twig and Welltyped. You know, Welltyped is Duncan Coots's firm, Duncan, the old wizard who's been around for a long time. You know, and they'll just chip away at it. And if the community wants it faster, there's probably things they can do to wax it and get it done faster. But in the meantime, we also are going to bring rollups in. Data availability will increase. Mithril is really growing a lot, by the way. And then also Hydra can be accelerated. There's tons of things you can do with Hydra 
to do all those types of things. Because you ask yourself, where am I going to use USDC? Microtransactions, tipping, lending, all these things. Well, almost all of that can be done off chain and reconciled in batches, which is perfect for UTXO style systems. So it's that Nintendo thing of going from Mario Brothers to Mario Brothers 3. You can you can really wax that engine and make it awesome. And then there's some off-chain stuff you can do, and then that's infinitely scalable. And then there's a lot of things that also you can push to partner chains to do. And then there's a lot of things, like Pima did this, for example, with uh, DC Spark. They've already done account abstraction. They've already done their own little version of, I think, Babel fees and other stuff like that. They're, they're pulling it all into their framework. Um, and then there's on-chain stuff that you can do as well. And that, that's deep into the guts of the system. And, and I've done a few videos kind of try to explain these nuances. The problem is that it's hard. And it's hard to explain. It's hard to understand. It's hard to keep all these ideas in your head. I've been doing it for 10 years, and it's natural for me. And I forget from time to time how hard it is for people to wrap their whole head around it. So what they do is they just say, oh, well, this is, I'm just going to stick to a single number. Like with the multi-core to single core, the, the hertz. Intel told everybody for a long time, the only thing that matters is gigahertz. 3 gigahertz, 4 gigahertz, whatever. So more is better. And they couldn't wrap their head around this idea that a 3 gigahertz chip was slower than a 2 gigahertz chip. They couldn't get it because they told everybody that's the metric you have to care about. So in our industry, it's TPS, transactions per second. They say, oh, they have 2,000 TPS. And you say, but we don't have TPS in Cardano. We have TPT, transactions per transaction, right? If you go to eutixo.org, you can see these transactions loaded with lots of shit that's not related to each other it's pretty it's crazy. crazy it is crazy yeah, yeah. and and our, our real world performance of that can be hundreds of tps at the current design of the system but then you go talk to an ethereum developer or a Solana developer they say one transaction per block one transaction per second you know it's just it doesn't go in the brain because they don't understand the paradigm and they don't care to understand the paradigm because it's not relevant to them it is what it is does it affect our growth no and do we have a strategy as an ecosystem to you know kind of grow through it? Yeah, sure. And can it be accelerated? Yeah, anything can be accelerated, but you have to either reduce something like quality and take existential risk, or you have to increase something like cost, you know, and run parallel teams and these types of things. And those trade-offs have to be discussed. And that's the point of Intersect is to have a members-based organization where you bring everybody together, the NFT people and the DeFi people and the governing bodies and all these things. And they all have that discussion and it, everybody's informed. And then at some point a consensus emerges and they say, okay, this is the, the strategy and we just go do it. And we live with the consequences for better or worse. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, that analogy, by the way, that was perfect because like I'm continuously trying to understand everything that's going on with Cardano and I'm like, I'm just at the surface still, right? So even when I'm sitting here asking you questions, I'm trying to, you know, ask from my perspective, somebody that's like a non-engineer. Um, but you, you, we just touched on the EUTXO, right? And I think that's right. really starting, the power of that is really starting to show, I think, in Cardano. How would you explain it in like the most simple terms, what EUTXO is? To anybody out there that that would want to know well first utxo the easiest way of explaining that is cash register accounting you know when you go and buy something from a cashier and use cash i know the kids today they don't use cash but like in the old days you know the bill comes up to eleven dollars and 92 cents you don't have eleven dollars now you open your wallet you have a twenty dollar bill and you hand them a twenty dollar bill now what do they do they cut up that twenty dollar bill and take eleven dollars and 92 cents out of it and hand you back no it's an atomic unit. That's your input into the transaction. And they open up the cash register. Do they have the ability to like manufacture pennies and things like No. They take bills they already have in the cash register and they count them up until they balance the transaction. So they got to go count up that $8 and so-and-so cents. And so you get a five and three ones and then you get your change and they hand it to you. And that balances both sides, the inputs and outputs. The cash register has to balance with these types of things. You get your change. Well, that's UTXO. That's great for the movement of assets, but it doesn't do anything for the state of a program. So you have a script that represents a program. And then what happens is that you need to be able to transition that from one state to the next state to the next state. So like you have a DEX. And you say, okay, well, I, I need to be able to swap. You know, you have ADA and I have Hosky, and for some fucked up reason, you want to buy a worthless asset. Okay, well, somebody needs to trigger that program to initiate a swap to happen. So you have one state transition to another state. Now, just like a cash register, 
you can't go tear your state apart or these types of things. It's an atomic transaction. You want this with these types of systems because then you have determinism in it. If it settles, it settles. When you have systems where they're, they're kind of open and they don't quite close, then you run into all these front running concerns or other things like that. And also it's unpredictable what the cost of that transaction is. So you get non-determinism in the system with an accounts-based model. So I'd really recommend you talk to the AXO guys, bring them on your show and it was like, have them demonstrate because they took this design to the, the logical extreme. And they said, well, if I have all of this stuff that's deterministic and it's catch register, like I can do a ton of stuff and batch it. So I can do all these things off chain, all these transactions, all these things. And then when they come back on, I get a mathematical guarantee that it's, it's ordered correctly and it's right. And I only have very limited use of the Cardano blockchain, but that's how it should be. You enable a whole financial ecosystem that has all the properties of a blockchain, but you only use the blockchain for an entry and exit point for that. So UTXO has that nice property about it. It's isomorphic to accounts that we wrote a paper called Chimeric Ledgers that shows how to transfer something in account to UTXO and back. And what's nice about it is now that it exists, it's a foundational model that you can layer on top. You can always abstract an account system on top of a UTXO system if you want. In fact, some people have even written SIPs like DC Spark has been pursuing this, for example, and they've even created an emulation of it. And a lot of DAP developers do this because they need some properties that the account system is a little better. They need mutable state and all these other things. They want to run a virtual machine. And that's fine. You know, but when your base model has these properties, you get a lot of mathematical certainty. You know, the other thing is it's a lot easier to reason about program behavior. Okay, so once you have these, these atomic transactions that settlement tells you a lot of stuff, you can write code tests to reason about all the value flow inside your program, and you can get strong proofs that you don't have a weird value flow. So it eliminates a lot of the traditional problems we've had with Ethereum, like the reentrancy bug or other, that caused the DAO hack or you know, other types of things like that. So it's a more secure development model and it's a much more paralyzable model because you can easily go on chain and off chain and you keep preserve your guarantees. So if you think about where the world's going, it's layer two, it's side chains, it's centralized server over here and back. So if, if you have a model that doesn't really care if it's on-chain or off-chain, everything just kind of settles and it works out, that's the better model long-term. It's, it's the most paralyzable. So I just blew my mind when I saw these Ethereum developers saying you can't scale Cardano. I was like, guys, you're saying you can't scale a supercomputer. You can't scale a thousand cores or something. Like, what the fuck are you saying? You guys are the guys that have the model that has a lot of problems. That's why they gave up on layer one sharding with Ethereum. For the longest time, they had this roadmap about how they're going to shard and have be a billion zillion transactions per second. And lo, lo and behold, now what's their strategy? Rollups in layer two. They're going to move off chain. And then you got Vitalik talking about the wonders of UTXO, you know, and you see these interviews and they pretend like they've invented all of it. Meanwhile, we knew that from the beginning because we started in the functional programming world and we said, well, this, this is how we do things there. You know, and you can use this uh, in a very clever way and everything's a state machine and it's very beautiful computer science and you get strong math-based guarantees of program behavior. And then once you have that as your foundation, it's very easy to build any structure on or off chain that you want with that. And you can get anything you want with that. It's also very easy to shard and scale. Really, really easy to do that. And it's also easy to do the proofs around it too. When you roll up outputs, it's a lot easier to do that. The Bitcoin space pioneered this with bulletproofs and you know, these other things. Plus it's the oldest model. You know, we have uh, 15 years of history from Bitcoin to look to and understand and reason about. They're all in the Bitcoin space being like, oh, BitML, it's so great. Oh my God, it's great. They're just praising that they've just added smart contracts to things like, yeah, we know how great UTXO based smart contracts are. We've kind of been doing that for a while in Cardano land, uh, but they're, they're right to celebrate in that. It's a good thing, the, the model, it makes a lot of sense. Um, so yeah, so cash register accounting, easier time on chain, off chain, massively paralyzable determinism, especially on the fee structure, uh, easy program architecture for sharding and scale. These are just some of the in, in, uh, intrinsic benefits, but you know, the everyday consumer doesn't have to care. At the end of the day, they, what they care about is, are the transaction fees low? Um, you know, it, it, do, do I have reasonable settlement time in my wallet? And also over time, will this get better, faster, and cheaper? 
And the answer is yes to all of the above. The fees are very low. The settlement time is pretty reasonable. And it's going to only get better. And over time, we have a lot of great strategies as an ecosystem to shard and scale. So, you know, it'll always get better, faster, and cheaper regardless of the load inside the system. And from the developer's viewpoint, is it easy to develop on? Is it secure to develop on? Is, this, is the platform taking a lot of hyper-complicated things and abstracting them from me so I don't have to worry too much about it? Like, imagine how horrible it would be to be a database developer and have to worry about where everything goes in memory. That's why they wrote SQL, because you do not want to know that. It's too hard. You know, and so we're getting there as an ecosystem and we're building those abstractions into the ecosystem. So the developer is happy. And then, you know, from the business viewpoint, do I have existential risk in this platform or am I hurting myself in this platform? Well, do I have price predictability? You know, do I have a situation where Tuesday it's 10 times more expensive than Monday or 10 times cheaper on Wednesday than it was on Tuesday? And also, do I have existential risk in that? My, my app could crash and I lose all my money or a hacker could break in or do something like that. You see, so everybody looks at it with a kind of a slightly different lens. And Cardano is a product of trade-offs, just like Ethereum is a product. And Solana is a product of trade-offs. It's not like we're better. It's just we chose different trade-offs as an ecosystem. And I think in the long term, those trade-offs are, are much better for a decentralized holistic balance system than the trade-off that they chose. And the market will ultimately decide, you know, one way or the other in the long term. Yeah. So last question in terms of that, all of those things you met, mentioned, you know, faster, cheaper, um, continuing to be more scalable. What for this year, 2024, what, what would you say is being prioritized the, the most in order to continue to scale properly or in the right direction? So the Hydra program is working its way through and partner chains is becoming very developed. And I think those two things are going to have a huge and meaningful impact on the system. Um, a lot of foundational research is being closed, meaning papers are published. They've gone through peer review. They've been accepted and people are happy with them. And there's two directions. One is fast finality, which is super important for bridges, but also important for dApps uh, and commercial transactions. So that's Orbor's Paris. And then the other is... Um, sharding you know so that's the input endorsers and uh orbors laos work stream those are coming to a conclusion uh in the first half of the year meaning that the research is done and then it's a community decision of how quickly we want to move on those types of things and what we're trying to do is stand up an ecosystem where if the community really does want to move quickly on the layer one stuff they can uh the other dark horse which is seldom mentioned is plutus v3 is coming with sip 1694 and that includes bls support when you look at all those primitives there's enormous house of work taking Halo 2 and combining it with Pluto Eris and this other house of stuff. And it's, that's crypto gobbledygook for we're getting recursion and rollups. And that means all this stuff that's happening in Ethereum not only works on Cardano, works best on Cardano. You know, so, so we will be probably one of the dominant zero knowledge layers thanks to all the work in Midnight. Um, and that is going to come to Cardano as well. ZK bridges, rollups, all these types of things. And that will have a huge scaling impact in certain domains and certain applications. Not all, but some. The other thing is with partner chains, you take a lot of the stuff that's polluting the main chain and you can run it in the partner chain and they'll be a lot happier there. You know, But it still is a service layer to Cardano. So we DAP developers still get access to that stuff. So it's a multimodal approach. You know, There's a a strong layer two game. There's a strong game of optimizing the base layer. There's a deep research pipeline for next generation protocols. There's some finishing work like getting Genesis in and UTXO HD in and these types of things. A lot of optimization in terms of the ability to expand the block size. Um, and then, you know, you've got completely new capabilities like rollups coming and partner chains coming, you know, that add. So when you sum all that together, there's a little something for everybody inside that scalability uh, question. And also just improvements in the libraries, the development methodologies. Everybody's kind of learning from each other. They're learning how to use the EU TIXO model to make it more efficient. The programming languages are getting more efficient. Look at the difference between Plutus V1 and 2 in terms of the space. Look at Aiken in terms of the space utilization and these types of things. So more efficient languages and development techniques are another part. And that's your today scaling. And then, you know, you look over a three, five year horizon, it's all done. You have full end to end zero knowledge. You have a beautiful layer two ecosystem that doesn't require token. It runs on ADA, you know, and it's available to every dApp. You have, uh, you know, a vibrant ecosystem of service layers that are bespoke built for the services they're providing. So that doesn't have to transact on Cardano, just the asset management happens there. You have 
a layer one that's fully sharded and its only limitation is the network stack. So that means you can go thousands of TPT. You know, it's uh, it's a very good end to end ecosystem overall, very balanced. And plus, you didn't have to get rid of EEUTXO, so you get all the program verification, the formal methods. You get deterministic pricing, especially when fee markets come in, the tiered pricing idea that they have and these types of things. You actually peek through and get, you know, price predictability for your transactions, create markets for it. Yeah, so all that's coming, you know, and, and we're speeding up, not slowing down. You, know, you look at our pace of delivery as an ecosystem. We have demonstrated the last two years the ability to pursue super difficult things in parallel. Midnight in parallel with partner chains, in parallel with Hydra, in parallel with Mithril, in parallel with on-chain governance, in parallel with Genesis, in parallel with UTXO HD, in parallel with the construction of Intersect. I mean, all of these things are happening in parallel, whether critics want to admit it or not. And there's literally like a thousand people across all of them, you know, in our organization, other organizations and community involvement. And that's just on the core side. And then you got the DAP ecosystem doing its whole thing and building all these things and writing SIPs, you know, and Adam Dean is doing this and this guy's doing this and this guy's doing that. And that's all happening in parallel too. And then you listen to critics, they say a ghost chain, there's nothing happening. It's like, are you just, are you just stupid? <laughs> or are you just being dishonest? There's only two options. Yeah, I get the, I get the sense there's no way. I mean, a lot of them are well-informed of the crypto space. So there's just, I think they're just, maybe being to a little dishonest. So you just, you just mentioned Midnight. Um, I want to talk about that a little bit. It's kind of a company incubated by, by Input Global. And I, so I, I saw once you said, you can't do a Midnight without Cardano. So I wanted to ask what, for the audience that hasn't even, that does, is not aware of what Midnight is, what is Midnight and what exactly did you mean by that? So Midnight is a natural extension of a lot of R&D that we've done in trying to preserve and protect three basic human rights, the freedom of association, commerce, and expression. So one of the problems with blockchain technologies is they can't keep a secret. So we've been trying to get blockchains to be able to keep a secret. They're really good at telling the truth. That's their thing. But they can't hide the private state of things. And so if you think about real life business, 99% of the time, all business has a public side and a private side. You create a bank account. You're, maybe you're a publicly known customer of JP Morgan Chase, but they're not allowed by the BSA to tell people how much money you have in your bank account. So that's the private side. You, you go and you go to a hospital and you get some treatment done. Okay, you're a patient at that hospital. They can confirm that. But they can't say what they did to you. That's the private side of the relationship. You go use a university. Uh, I was a university student. Okay, great. But they can't reveal your grades. That's FERPA, these types of things, right? So the problem is, how do you reconcile that blockchain land? Because they're saying you're going to take all the centralized institutions, all the centralized applications, all of these things, and you're going to put them on a blockchain. Well, if you do that in Ethereum or Cardano or Bitcoin or any of these systems, all of that stuff is now public. It has to be because they can't keep a secret. So the first generation of these concepts was transactional privacy. That was Monero and Zcash and these other things. And they said, oh, okay, well, we're just going to have everything be private. But the only thing that you can really be private is asset movements. You send me a transaction, I send you a transaction, nobody knows. Okay. But you can't do smart contracts. And the problem is if you want to do business on a blockchain, we learned a little while ago, you know, with Ethereum, it's a pretty good idea to have smart contracts. So we started an R&D project six years ago to talk about how to do private smart contracts. And it took us and the ecosystem as a whole was ZEXE. We built Kachina. ZEXE came from the Zcash guys that long to figure out how to do it. So Midnight is the realization of that, which means you can now have a public and a private side together with smart contracts. So private smart contracts. Once you have that capability, then you can start bringing real world businesses completely into the blockchain space. Because you can take all your medical records and other things, and now that you have a private system, but then you can take the public parts of the business and also run them there. So that's that Web3 with real life business. Now, you can't have that without Cardano in that. You need to launch it. And there's, it's really hard to launch a cryptocurrency these days as a layer one. Where do you get your liquidity from, your decentralization from, your network effect from, your security from, all these things? It took six years for Cardano to grow to this scale. 
and all these other guys launching layer ones, they're like, God, this is so hard. We're spending all this money and we're just not really getting anywhere. Look at how many billions of dollars Solana and Aptos and Polygon and all these other guys have had to spend to get some network effect and get some launch. So what we did is I recognized in 2016, what's going to happen is you're going to get to a point where whatever layer ones you got, you got. And then people are going to use layer ones to bootstrap ecosystems. And I wrote Cardano SL and Cardano CL. I said Cardano settlement layer and Cardano control layer. That's what we called it back in 2016. Why Cardano? So we created partner chains to be the CL component, the, 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 the things that you launch. And so Midnight is a partner chain of Cardano. And it creates that, that service of programmable confidentiality, uh, that ability to have a private state inside the system. Uh, and now all the Cardano applications will get that capability, but you can sell that capability as a service to other ecosystems as well as an API call. So you can sell that to Ethereum apps. You can sell that to Bitcoin apps. You can sell that to Polkadot or Solana or other such things. And from their perspective, it looks like a layer two on their system, even though it ends up settling on Cardano and doing all those types of things. What does that translate to is Cardano is open for business because you know what's going to happen is somebody's going to create a decentralized large language model and a decentralized social network and a centralized telecommunications company and blah, blah, blah. And all those are going to fill out your service layer of Cardano, hundreds of them there, and they're going to be selling those services into other ecosystems. Those ecosystems pay back into the system and eventually it settles on Cardano and then you know creates transaction flow into Cardano that otherwise wouldn't be there. So Midnight is really an, our most advanced piece of technology we've ever worked on. Multi-resource consensus and recursive snarks and private smart contracts. And my God, it's, it's a technological marvel. And it's just been, I've been tearing my hair out trying to figure out how to put it all together. We have an amazing team of people. Like Aram Barak is an amazing CEO and a great CTO, Ben Beckman. We have an incredible team of cryptographers there. And they've been diligently working on this for six years it, since before Cardano actually launched. There were the initial concepts started coming into play and we started talking about it. Um, you know, the other side of it that's really super cool, this allows us to start looking at new tokenomics the dual token model. So one token owns the system, governs the system, operates the system, and one token's the fuel token, which can have a variable monetary policy. So one's deflationary like Cardano, the other one floats, and that gives you predictable pricing. You know, that's a super cool concept because if that model works, you can reuse that model for any service layer, like Igon, for example, in decentralized hosting, or World Mobile, for example, with their telco, where there's an ownership of the telecommunication capability, but then there's also the, the daily pricing of minutes and data on their network and these types of things, which has needs variability. If you have one token that prices both, it's overloaded. It can't actually accurately price. And they ran into this with Ethereum and their fees and these types of things. So it's also an exploration of dual tokenomics and uh, how to get those tokenomics to, to work appropriately. And the other really, really cool part of it is this is how you get regulated products into the Cardano space. Like if you think of a security, it has broker dealer, it has a private state and a public state. And you have to collect a lot of information and create a compliance circle around it. Well, you read all the reports, they want to bring trillions of dollars of securities onto blockchains for instant settlement. Okay, great. You're only going to do that if you have computational privacy. So you need a good identity system, Prism, and you need a good privacy system, Midnight. And those two things come together and now you can do regulated business on the system. Wow. And that's where all the growth is going to come from, right? Same for mining medical records, the same for, you know, getting user data, but anonymizing it, these types of things. It's, it's almost ironic, you know, Cardano, just very secluded, right? Like on its, I think I've heard you refer to it or thought of as an island for some time now, right? Yeah. It's, it's ironic to think that this midnight could truly bring into play an opportunity for the industry to to actually start kind of coming together and coexist in a, in a whole entirely new way than it has before. Exactly, because they no longer view Cardano as an adversarial thing. They say, "Oh, that's our service layer, and we we purchase decentralized infrastructure from it." You know, and Chainlink kind of opened that business up. It didn't really matter what host chain it's on; it sells to everybody. So that's the hope. And there's some great ventures uh, like Layer Zero, for example, that are already starting to talk around this cross blockchain ecosystem and Omni apps and these things. And I think Cardano is going to be a great contender and we, we're going to be one of the best places for people to launch. And we hybridized technology. We took the substrate framework and 
basically learned from it and built a lot of cool stuff on top of it. Uh, and now that framework, I, I think, is best in class for this type of model. Uh, and then it takes all the security and reliability of Cardano and Cardano is selling its trust. It's selling its security. You know, it's the backbone of backbones. It's the most reliable cryptocurrency around. It never goes down and can't be hacked. It's got all these great properties about it. That's what you paid for with high assurance and peer review and Haskell and these things. We might as well get what we paid for, you know? <laughs> we spent so much time doing this as a community. It would be a shame if we didn't sell it, you know, and people enjoy the security and reliability of uh, this type of system. So we'll see where it goes, but I'm very optimistic and hopeful. And I think we have a lot of surprises and cool business model innovation and ecosystem development innovation that we brought to bear. But generally speaking, I think it's just a beautiful piece of technology. It's a great blending of Rust and JavaScript. Um, there's just an amazing proof stack. Uh, a ton of incredible people are doing the best work of their careers to pull these things together. And I say it always comes back to ACE, freedom of association, commerce, and expression. You can't have that unless you have some degree of privacy. You know, you, you look at how many people, it, like look at a university, you know, the publicly poll people, is the president of the university doing a great job? Yes, he is doing a great job. And then you do an anonymous poll. Is the president of the university doing a great job? Fuck no. That guy's an idiot. We lost 30% of our endowment. Uh, everybody hates us. Enrollments are down. We've. I don't have any good graduate students, all this type of stuff. Why do they say? Because they don't fear reprisal. You need to have confidentiality in order to have honesty. You know, it's the same for carbon markets. You know, you think, okay, we COP28, we want to rebuild the whole world. We want everything to be carbon neutral. We want everything to be equitable and fair. Well, how do you get there if you don't have confidentiality in your supply chains and these types of things? Whistleblowers have protections. Well, I just noticed the boss is dumping poison into the lake. Are you going to go publicly say that? You know, the boss will shoot you. No, you need privacy to be able to do these types of things. Like who in Russia is going to be like, yeah, I'll tell you the story about Vladimir Putin. They have a problem where people just keep falling out of windows in that country. So how do you get honesty out of that country? You can't unless you have protection. So you have to have that to be able to secure these markets and get things to go. And we're moving to a multipolar world. There's the Chinese way of doing things and the Russian way of doing things and the European and the American. They're not getting along anymore. You know, and so how do you move between these systems and preserve a universal human right within it? You can't in the conventional sense. So you need some sort of system to be able to do that. So I think this is a very good compromise. It also allows you to do selective disclosures because if you have programmable privacy, you know what you can do? You can build into your smart contract disclosure. So you can say, okay, well, you know, um, if all my token holders get together and two thirds vote yes, we'll uh, unblind the smart contract and we can see the state of it. So we can know, uh, you know, who did what where. Okay. So you have a pedophile on your platform, you know, and they can say, hey, you know, we want to find out who that is. And they can dox them. And it doesn't mean the government gets a back door. You know, so that's the cool part about uh, having programmable privacy and programmable things. You can actually build selective disclosure regimes. Who would want to do selective disclosure? You run a business. Your auditor. Your CFO, the CEO, certain key people in the business, maybe just maybe they have God mode and they can see everything because they run the business and they're legally liable for it. But on the outside, nobody should be able to see what's going on in your business. Do you want your competitors knowing how much you're paying your engineers or these types of things? So we talk about DAOs. How the fuck do you run a DAO? Everybody, oh, we're going to DAO. We're going to DAO. We're going to, oh my God, we can't wait to have a DAO. It's going to be so great. Okay. But but let's think about this. You know, uh, do you really want everybody who works for the Dow to have publicly disclosed salaries? Do you want everybody who works for the Dow to have their resumes publicly accessible, their social security numbers accessible and all these types of things? Probably not. Maybe the HR people can see it who've been given delegated authority and then it starts looking like a co-op, like Mondragon or any of these things, right? But now it's just on a blockchain. So you have a public and a private side. This is the only way to do that. Now Cardano will be best in class for this. No one has these capabilities. People are building up to them, like Espresso with Hyperplonk and ZK Sync is thinking about it and all these other guys, but we're, we're light years ahead of them in terms of these capabilities. So we will be first and best to market for the entire ecosystem, open for business, ready to go for all the developers in the major ecosystems. And Cardano is going to give that to the world. So it's a huge, it's a huge step forward. And, uh, you know, it's our fault in that last year we didn't do the best of jobs of explaining it. 
you know, I've been so close to midnight for so long and I love this project so much. I just thought it was, you know, common sense. And that's the problem. If you're so close to something, sometimes you don't realize again that you have too much familiarity. And as a result, you take things for granted and how you explain it and communicate it. Um, and so some people thought this was like an adversarial thing and IO is now building another blockchain and they're abandoning Cardano. And I was like, uh, it's kind of funny saying we're abandoning Cardano when like 80% of the people that work for IO are still Cardano people. It's like, if that's abandonment, I really want to know like what, what, uh, what embracing means. Um, well, yeah, but, you know, I, I, I was going to ask you that because that is, yeah. that's like a headline really. Yeah, like oh, yeah, Charles, yeah. Charles and not an input output. They're working on midnight. We told you Cardano's done. They're done with it. You know, it's a brand new thing. And I wanted you to speak to that a little bit because it's, it's yeah. almost like, it's almost like opposite because I think Midnight's going to benefit Cardano like yes, a lot. It's going to bring millions of people to Cardano land and actually make them care about Cardano and think it's awesome and unique and interesting. And, you know, we've won if they care about Midnight and they, they've they never even heard of Cardano because at the end of the day, it adds volume and transactions and real world utility to Cardano and it makes our ecosystem holistic and better. But, you know, part of it is also just people need to grow up a little bit. You know, not everything is duplicitous and, and, and you know, uh, so many people have devoted their lives and their reputation and their and their the, the best years of their career to this project as a whole, Cardano and its extensions. And it does get a little frustrating at times when you spend 10 years doing something, saying the same thing every single year, and then you never get the benefit of the doubt on anything. So I get it that you don't get it or we didn't explain it right, but for the love of God, can you just shut up about me? not being devoted and loving this thing. I've carried these logs on my back for a long fucking time, you know, and I think, just think it through. We have everything to gain by making Cardano stronger. And uh, we, we have nothing to gain by leaving Cardano, you know, it, we, in, in trying to build a completely new ecosystem from scratch. The days of building new ecosystems is over. It's the days of now partnering with people, creating liquidity, alliances, finding mutual interests and standards. That's where you go. You never leave people behind anymore. You take them with you everywhere you go because they're good people. This is the best community in all of crypto. The Cardano is the smartest. It's the most capable. It has some of the best ideas inside of it. And also this is a community that always shows up no matter how bad it is. Two and a half cent ADA, they show up. $3 ADA, they show up. 25 cent ADA, they show up. You know, you host workshops, 50 countries, no problem at all. Everyone will be saturated and filled. Tell them to come to Argentina for a constitutional convention. They say, okay, just make sure we don't get robbed. You know, they'll show up every day, 24-7. So why would you leave those people behind? You know, you take them with you. And that's the point of Midnight. It's like it takes the ship to new places. And for the first time ever, we now get to trade with Ethereum. We get to trade with Bitcoin. We actually get to show there's real value here. And uh, hopefully they, 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 take a second look and they realize that we've built something really beautiful and, uh, you know, really special as an ecosystem and they come and stay. And, uh, that adds a lot of value to everybody. The adversarial days they're over, you know, uh, the, the tribalism is over. There's no more tribalism on the Cardano side. You know, uh, I understand there's a lot of bitterness and people are pretty angry and, uh, rightfully so because we've been mistreated for so long, but we're never going to get ahead if we keep litigating the battles of the past and getting angry about the past, the only way you get ahead is just reset, restructure, and uh, and look to the future and talk about how do we win tomorrow. I love that. That's what I'm talking about. Because I that's like my biggest thing in crypto. Because I, I obviously I cover a ton of Cardano, but I cover all I cover a lot of stuff, and I I would enjoy the space so much more. I think everybody would if there wasn't that tribalism. And because I don't like confrontation to begin with in general, let alone just like in the crypto space, because it's it's it is the way it is. So I love the fact that it seems like Cardano organically and the way that these products are being developed and uh, everything that's happening. It seems like Cardano might lead the way in terms of bringing the space together because right. of all the innovations that's taken place here. So and breaking news. I mean, this is you're this is crazy. Breaking news. You're not leaving Cardano for midnight. That's crazy. <laughs> I know. I, I, you know. Broken right on this show. I've decided that Cardano is still my future. I love Cardano. But, you know, Car it's a two-way relationship, and Cardano's got to decide, like, everybody's role moving forward. And the point of Intersect and on-chain governance is you have to get real, and you have to go from 
a precedent and an honorary role to a formal role. And, uh, and my hope is that IOI can be the center of excellence for engineering and science. I don't really want to be in the business of growth hacking for Cardano and figuring out how do we get another 10 million users or 200 million users or whatever. I've had to do that you know, in necessity because other core entities did not spend the money and did not measure up. And that was their job and they didn't do it. So I said, well, you know, I love this project. I love these people. I don't want this to fail. So I stepped up and a lot of community members stepped up too. And they spent their own money out of their own pocket, millions of people, you know, across the world and never met each other. And they said, we believe in this thing. And it could be simple things like they just showed up and gave away t-shirts or they sponsored a Cardano booth at a local conference or something like that. Some people got tattoos of the logo and they would just tell everybody, this is Cardano, this is so amazing, Cardano, yay, woo. They went and built something on Cardano, these types of things. The value of Cardano comes from the efforts of all those people collectively. You know, they, they took personal accountability for all of it. So it, it may, maybe it was actually for the best that it ended up the way it was because if there was just one central entity that woke up every day to grow Cardano, people wouldn't take that ownership and they wouldn't build that community for these types of things. And, uh, you know, the same happened with Bitcoin back in the day. I'm old enough to remember the early days of Bitcoin. And, you know, back then there was no money, man. We Bitcoin wasn't worth anything. You go, you know, StarCraft tournaments and like fifth prize was 25 Bitcoins. It's like, ah, shit, I didn't get the hundred bucks. Oh, well, I'll take my 25 Bitcoin. Maybe one day it'll be worth something, you know. It's, it was, uh, it, but they were fun times because there was this camaraderie. Everybody just loved Bitcoin. Everybody loved the philosophy and the ideals. And we didn't take ourselves too seriously, you know, as an ecosystem. And where it got a little crazy is when the money got involved and then the whole conversation changed to, this cult-like mentality of Team Orange will dominate and price go up, we're all great people. Um, so I hope we don't turn into that. That's an anti-pattern of a community. And uh, so far, it's still such a collaborative collegial environment. Uh, and there's no reason to ever leave that. It's, uh, it's home for me. Yeah, cool. All right, well, we're going on an hour and a half here. I, I do have one more question, though, because I, I was wondering, you know, through, through the journey of Cardano and in, in your time in the crypto space, what would you say... The biggest challenge so far that Cardano has overcome, and what's the biggest challenge now lying ahead for Cardano? Well, I mean, the biggest challenge was relevance, you know, to inspire enough people to actually take it seriously and for it to survive. We've been in the top 10 basically since launch, and everybody year by year has invested a lot of time, effort, and, and money and, uh, and mind share into a collective success. And for that to have staying power and durability is pretty remarkable. I mean, if you take a look at the projects in 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023, and now 2024, they're all different. Yet Cardano is still there in each one of those years. It's pretty remarkable when you think about that. And for it to stay relevant, stay evolving, stay growing uh, is is an extraordinary thing. And it's it's highly undervalued, I think. You know, Even just the criticism of it, the fact that every year it's still being criticized. Like how many people are criticizing NXT right now? You know, how many people are criticizing bit shares right now? How many people are criticizing steam right now? They're not, they don't even think about it. The fact that they hate us says we're still relevant, right? We're still in the conversation. We're still there. The fact that they even say ghost chain and they know to say ghost chain, it says you're still there. You know, uh, it's like that celebrity will never go away. It's just, you keep seeing him in movies. He's like, I hate that guy. Why is he still famous? I don't know. So Cardano's there, you know, and that's that was its greatest challenge is to stay relevant and stay thriving and growing. And I'm very proud that not only did we overcome it, we we thrive. In terms of the greatest upcoming challenge, on-chain governance is the single hardest thing you can do. Building governments is hard. If we were good at it, the United States would be running great. Name one government that you can look to and say it's perfect and it's just everything's great. Can't. Humans are flawed. You know, we have we have uh problems. We have uh, inability to see past our own biases. We have cognitive flaws that make it really hard for us to coordinate. And coordinating in a trustless environment at scale, so many different languages, so many different cultures, different value sets, it's never been done. And so uh, if Cardano does the single biggest innovation in collective governance in human history, it's worth a Nobel Prize. So that's what we're facing right now. And we're thriving. But we can't lose vigilance. We have to keep pushing forward. But in solving that problem, it's a, it's a much greater problem than Satoshi ever solved. 
Satoshi solved a huge problem, you know, with uh, with proof of work and the, in resolving Byzantine generals with proof of work. But it wasn't even close to anywhere near the complexity of on-chain governance and, and being able to make that effective and efficient and recursive. So that's the big challenge. Um, everything else is just a computer science problem. Like, how do we get more scale? It's like, oh, yeah, throw 50 graduate students and give them enough time and They'll come up with amazing super protocol and, and you'll have your MacGuffin and, you know, you go, you go kill some monsters and you, you know, you get your MacGuffin. It's like an RPG, you know, it's like, got to go slay the dragon. Then you get the sword and then you can use the sword to slay the wraith. And then you kill the wraith, you get the lich. And, you know, it's like, you know, you're going from one cave to the next cave. It's like, great. It's, it's just a game. You know, you could solve that. Decentralized governance is like, okay, let's reach a new collective state of humanity and like have collective wisdom and, collective super intelligence these days that's like ai alignment it's a super hard problem um and uh that is the problem i most want to solve in my career because you know what the, the the hidden truth of it is is that's not a cryptocurrency problem that's a human problem so if it works with cardano we can do that with a corporation we can do that with your club we can do that with a government which means we can rewrite the governments of humanity and make much better governments that are more inclusive and fair and are capable of solving real problems. So if we solve it there, we solve it for all of humanity, and that'll be the single greatest change in human history. You know, over our lifetime, every government in the world is gonna change. We don't really believe it, but look to my grandfather. He grew up during the Great Depression, and uh, that was the rise of the Soviet Union, the Nazi party, that was World War II, all these things. And at any moment, the world could have looked one way or the other. Had the wrong people won the war, every one of us would be speaking a different language, living a different lifestyle. A lot of us wouldn't even exist. So the world went in a particular direction. And he lived through all of that in his arc of his life. And his great-grandfather lived through a completely different arc. The rise of electrification and trains and mechanization and all this stuff. And his grandfather lived through Napoleon, running around, unifying Europe and these types of things. You see how these things change, right? So every... 50 to 100 years, the whole human race reboots the way things work. And this is the next reboot cycle that we're going through right now. And the work we do with Cardano is a proof of concept for a new way of governing and managing people and humans getting together. So that's our challenge to overcome. And if we do it, we just discover the holy grail. And we got to take it and show everybody. That's our next challenge after that is to convince the world that this is the way to go. And if we get there, then we end up old men looking back at a world that's a lot more fair than the one we grew up in, you know, that, that has honesty and integrity inside of it. So that's why you can never leave, you know, because the problems are so seductive. It's like, what else, what am I going to do in my life? I could go be a bison rancher and sit on the ranch and just like, oh, this is fun. It's good to have money. But do you really want to have money in a total, a totalitarian government? Going back to Jack Ma, he was the one of the richest guys and most powerful guys in China. And now he's a nobody because the governance structure decided to purge him. Look at all the Russian oligarchs that ran afoul of Putin. They were super powerful. They yachts and private jets, beautiful women, life is good, dachas, uh, you know, the eyes galore. Then suddenly they just, they caught a, a case of falling out of a window. They caught a case of drinking some polonium tea. Now they're gone. So, you know, it's no, no good to be a rich person in a totalitarian society because it's good until it's not. And when it's not, it's just as bad as the rest of them. You get gulagged. So the only thing that really matters is the pres preservation and protection of freedom and liberty uh, and, and making sure that it, you're a good custodian of it for the next generation. And that's what we do here. That's, that's our task. That's what we do every day when we wake up whether it be midnight and making sure we can create blockchains that can keep a secret because that's required for our, our human rights, or it be Cardano with decentralized governance and showing how to get a lot of people together who don't like each other or know each other to agree on something and move forward and actually have a good result uh, from it, or building free and fair financial marketplaces where you get to be your own bank or banking the unbanked in Africa and connecting the unconnected in Africa so they have unrestricted access to the internet these things. This is what we do. This is who we are as an ecosystem. It's not sexy or glorious. And as you can see every day, we get criticized brutally and harshly and unfairly and sometimes fairly. But just like waking up every morning, I got to go to that cold plunge and I look at the water and I know it sucks, but you know what? I know on the other side, it's going to be better, you know, because you get a big rush afterwards and you're like, yeah. And I also did the hardest thing in the day at the beginning of the day. 
So that's what we're doing at Cardano right now. We're doing the hardest thing possible right now. And everything else is downhill from there. It's just a, it's just like slaying the dragon or something. I was like, oh yeah, I can do that. You know, I'll just read the tutorial on it. That's another great analogy, I think, to end to end the chat here is uh, taking that Cardano cold plunge. And I I appreciate you, man, coming on the channel, chatting chatting with the community. I appreciate you taking that cold plunge every day as we kind of hustle. And uh, is there any any final words? you have for the for the audience out there well i need all of you to take the cold plunge join intersect intersectmbo.com join it and uh become part of it become a member of it um you know uh participate in the sip process build on cardano uh and if anything just learn the philosophy of it even if you're not a cardano fan keep liberty in your heart that's the uh one big contribution the united states made to the world for better or for worse we started the revolution Sometimes we're not good custodians of it. I'd argue right now we're terrible custodians of it, but uh, it left a lot of people around realizing the best way of doing things is when people are free. And uh, these systems, blockchains and cryptocurrencies, they're ultimately at their core systems of freedom that are also mature enough to realize humans are deeply flawed people. In some cases, you can't trust people in the long run, so you have to create systems that are self-regulating. So understand the concepts of why we're here. It's not about money go up, token go up. It's deeply philosophical. And if we fully embrace them, we're going to live in a much better world. Cool. Well, Charles, thanks again, man. I, I appreciate you. We got to do it again. Let's, we waited two years this time. Maybe next time we, we won't wait as long. But I, I have fun talking with you. And uh, God bless you, my friend. And, and keep hustling out there. Cheers. Cheers. And if you're out there, everybody, please make sure to share this video. Subscribe if you're not a subscriber smash the like. I'll see you in the next one. God bless.